Hello again. Um, I'm EJ Kreiner. Uh, I'm presenting this talk uh, for Hawkeye 360. Uh, my colleague, Dan Kajacob, uh, is also here, the director of space. I couldn't get him to come up and do this presentation, so uh, I'm here. I'm here again right now. Uh, I realize uh, I'm standing between us and the Hard Rock uh, Cafe, so hopefully I'll keep this entertaining and um, we can chat about space. Uh, the topic for the talk uh, talk today is uh, first I'll give you a quick overview of, uh, of Hawkeye 360, um, a, a little bit more in depth, um, and, and show you some kind of uh, preliminary results uh, that we've seen. Uh, and, then, and then I want to talk about uh, uh, really uh, th three more things. So the first thing is, um, is, is just, just to emphasize how we plan to and how we are using GNU Radio and RF Knock in production in space. And, uh, and then I'll give you two use case examples of uh, situations that, uh, of, uh, of applications that we've developed and deployed over the last 12 months um, and how we've kind of integrated with GNU Radio and RFNOC to do that, uh, do that efficiently and, uh, and with a pretty small group of engineers. So um, I'm excited to present that. This slide should look familiar if you are here yesterday, um, but I'll give you another overview of our technical mission. So uh, as a reminder, Hawkeye 360, we're launching um, in two months, uh, two months from tomorrow, hopefully. Uh, we have a cluster of three small satellites. They're going to fly, and they're going to be, uh, uh, be co-visible. So uh, one RF emitter on the ground will be received from all three satellites, and then we'll perform physical measurements on that received signal, time of arrival, frequency of arrival, um, and we'll do TDOA, FDOA measurements. Uh, we'll collect everything um, from uh, 100 megahertz to 15 gigahertz, uh, DC to daylight. And uh, what's our development concept? Well, so we, we started Hawkeye 360 um, about three years ago, uh, last week. And, um, and so the fact is, we're launching a constellation of satellites in two months. So. Uh, there, if you look at the, uh, the amount of development and amount of technical work we've had to accomplish and that we're planning to use, um, there's no way we could accomplish that without the ecosystem and the tools that exist. And uh, that really starts with uh, GNU Radio, RFNOC, um, the Edis devices. And, um, and, and when you look at, at our history, so we were founded three years ago, um, a year after that, so within 12 months, we had software that was deployed, tested, and running on E310s in airplanes, and we uh, we did a, a talk that I'll uh, we did a demonstration that I'll talk about in just a couple slides, um, and uh, and the bottom line um, that I think is kind of interesting is that uh, when you use GNU Radio and RF Knock in the lab, that uh, the way we're using it, uh, it, it translates pretty well as we're finding into what we're going to be doing on space. Uh, this is some of the things we do. Um, uh, on the right there. Okay, so let's talk about our, our, our demo. So we went from nothing to a flight, flight demonstration within 12 months, and we did several flights past that. Um, and uh, this was kind of the first iteration of hardware and software that we did as a company. This is the Hawkeye flight kit. We've got a B200 and an E310 in a box. We've got some embedded code running on the E310. We've got a computer hooked up to the B200 to do a little bit more wide bandwidth captures. Um, we do some processing in real time on the E300 and the, on the ARM. Uh, we do some, uh, some recording and post-processing on the B200. And um, we attach it to airplanes. We've got three airplanes. And then we flew them around the Chesapeake Bay for, uh, for a couple hours, uh, recorded maritime signals, AIS. Uh, since then, we've done uh, other, other SOIs, including EPIRB, radar, uh, VHF, iridium. Um, the list goes on. And, uh, and this, uh, this flight kit is analogous to what we're going to be launching in, uh, in two months. This is our uh, Hawkeye payload. It's got a Zinc 7045. It's got three 9361s attached to that. It runs RF knock. It runs open embedded. And, uh, and we're running GNU Radio and deploying GNU Radio flow graphs, just like we do on the E310. Uh, OK. So uh, when we did the demo, well, what, what are the results? Um, we're a geolocation company. So when you do geolocation, the first thing you look at is, uh, is a theoretical performance limit. Uh, you 
can, if you're doing comms, you think of the theoretical performance limit as the Shannon limit. Um, if you're doing physical measurements, you think of the precision. Um, so how peaky is a standard deviation? That's your Stein error. And then you transform your uh, standard deviation measurement into a geographic error using uh, the kramer rao lower bound and the Jacobians of your measurement equations. Um, and so we have <clears throat> two, uh, uh, here uh, we're showing two orbital performance estimates. Uh, of, our, of our constellation on the left, we've got a single pulse. Uh, what do we expect is the best case scenario we can receive from a single uh, AIS emitter that we capture on our uh, cluster of satellites. And then on the right, uh, if, if you've got a ship that's uh, transmitting multiple pulses and we orbit, or we, pass, we pass by it, we're in low Earth orbit, um, so uh, a pass is about 10 minutes. So if we pass by in 10 minutes and receive 10 pulses, then uh, we can, the, the theoretical best case we can do is about a couple hundred meters. So, um, so we use this uh, theoretical analysis to guide our performance expectations for what we'd expect to see in a demo and are we doing things correctly and uh, are our algorithms right or are we totally hosed? Uh, and, um, and what we saw in our flight demo is that uh, we, we kind of, uh, we we're agreeing uh, in general terms with the Kramer Rao lower bound. Um, obviously, we're not better than the Kramer Rao lower bound, it's a lower bound. Um, and, uh, and, and generally, you can hope, hope to approach it if, uh, if everything is good. So uh, on the left, uh, you can see the different colored dots. You've got green, blue, and purple represent the airplane tracks. All of the red triangles represent the AIS ship location that's self-reported. So a benefit of using AIS as a target is that it includes a self-reported GPS location. So uh, we'll receive those signals, we'll perform physical measurements on that, and, uh, and then we extract the GPS location and use it as truth data. So um, it's really a uh, really interesting way to get a like uh, get, get a, a system tested and and evaluate the uh, error impact on that. Um, when we look, uh, oh, what is that on the right? Okay, so in the middle, um, we've taken the plot of the errors. Uh, so the, the blue X's on the left are our geolocation spot. And, uh, and, and just to actually illustrate kind of the, the performance of the Kramer Rao lower bound, uh, you can see a, p a point in the, in the upper left side where the AIS is, uh, it, there, there's an AIS point and you see this, this elongated ellipse of geolocation errors around that. That's, that's uh, actually results from the uh, propagation of your measurement equations from the, the three receivers orbiting in a circle to a point that's outside that geometry uh, and propagating that into there. So when we run the Kramer Rao lower bound, um, we can compare our em empirical errors that we achieve with what the Kramer Rao lower bound uh, actually shows us we should be getting. And so that's what we see in the middle. The colored dots are are um, our empirical results, and the contour lines are what the Kramer Rao lower bound says we should achieve. And uh, the the bottom line there is um, you can you can kind of try and correlate the colors with the, uh, the colors of the dots with the color bar on the right, and we generally tend to follow the, uh, uh, the Kramer Rao lower bound. Um, so that gives us confidence that when we port, this, uh, port these um, measurement uh, algorithms to space, we're going to achieve something that's relatively uh, close to what we've uh, theoretically predicted. So, um, really great results. We showed these within a year of the company's founding, um, thanks to all the uh, algorithm and prototype develop that we, de development that we could have um, from these open source tools ahead of time. All right, so in the, in the years since, we've been uh, preparing for launch. And uh, what, what do we use GNU Radio for? So basically, we're using this as a framework for all of our signal processing development. Um, you know, I, we, we looked at this, we're a new company, we've got uh, four, uh, two engineers when we started, and um, why, why would we, uh, you know, reinvent a scheduling algorithm? Uh, we don't need to reinvent item tags or a graphical process of doing this. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic workflow, and it, it works excellent for um, uh, both compute-intensive tasks with Volk um, and the architectures that we have there, and also for Python scripting uh, and you know basic utilities that we need to accomplish. Um, engineers come in having either known GNU Radio or we um, show them the tutorials and documentation and uh, get them involved in the community, and it's a great way to um, build technical competency. Um, in production, uh, 
uh, we've talked about build systems, um, and, uh, and there's always problems, but I'm not going to get into it because people get angry, um, and it's, it's always a heated debate. But, um, but some things that we need to see in order to actually have, have a system that, that supports us is, uh, is we've got to be able to build stuff every night, um, have those binary artifacts available for the x86, for AWS cluster, for the E310, for our payload. Um, We've got to have FPGA images that support daily updates. We've got to make sure that all of these commits that we have haven't broken anything that is reliable. And um, you know, if we actually accidentally send something up to the spacecraft, uh, we're not going to break it because then things become a lot more difficult to recover. Um, so you know, we it's, it's something it's something that we just have to consider. All right, um, on the RF NOx side. Uh, you know, uh, the, we start, start from the basics, use baseband processing, and, uh, and grow up from there. So we're using, uh, basically, you could think of it as an equivalent of, uh, of the E310. So, uh, <clears throat> so uh, it's an ARM, and you don't have all that much processing horsepower to it. And um, we got, we're going to want to do a lot of processing on this device. Uh, we have a 7045, so we've got a big FPGA to use, and uh, we need to push some, some processing applications down to that FPGA. A um, couple of those I want to highlight. I talked about the polyphase channelizer yesterday. Uh, today I'll talk about the um, OQPSK modem, uh, full duplex modem, and a, uh, a full rate data transfer to the processor. Uh, which, uh, which, which I'll get into that um, in just a little bit. Uh, but the theme of, of using our FPGA development is that we try to, we try to downsample higher bandwidths. Uh, we can capture at 40 or 50 megahertz, and, uh, but we can't absorb all of that on the processor, and we can't downlink all of that um, through our downlink. So we need to be able to do things in space on uh, you know, an edge device, to use the buzzword, um, <clears throat> in uh, a processing power efficient manner. In production, what does this look like? Uh, well, we need reliable and repeatable FPGA builds. Uh, I've got a diverse set of uh, RF knock blocks that I want to deploy. Um, the E310 is uh, just a little bit too small to support all of the use cases that I have. So I have a, a list of about 10 different FPGA images that I want to build whenever I change something. And um, what does that look like? Well, we have a build system. Uh, we use the RF knock YAML file definitions. Um, we, uh, every night, we run through and build all of the images and put them into our package manager. Um, we maintain FPGA build dependencies directly to the version of software that we're using. So if we try to deploy something to the E310, um, we deploy the software and it pulls in the FPGA images that are appropriate for that software. There's no version incompatibilities. Um, and we've made some other um, uh, helpful RF knock updates, this kind of tricks of the trade that we've, um, that we've worked on uh, over the months that, uh, that helped this development and, um, and prototyping workflow work a little bit better for us. And uh, overall, um, it works extremely well. Um, this is just one thing I'll mention here. Um, for the E310, I, you know, like I said, I've got like 10 images. They've all got different RF knock block streams. So a neat thing I do, for example, is that um, I define the FPGA images by YAML files. I export those, and I have a um, we have a uh, GNU radio block that parses the YAML files and dictates or decides which uh, which RF knock blocks I have in my flow graph, and then picks the correct FPGA bitstream to use. So we dynamically reprogram the E310. And um, this is what we're going to do in space, too. So um, you know, if we have a flow graph that has a DDC and a FIFO, you say your flow graph has a DDC and a FIFO, and then you look for an FPGA image that, that has that um, has that block support. You program that and use it. And then you don't have to change a flow graph between platforms. It, it works really well. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, that, that's great. All right, so uh, let's go on to use cases. Um, OQPSK communication system. Uh, we have. Uh, a software defined radio, and we need to support a high rate uplink and a high rate downlink, so two megabits per second up and up to 50 megabits per second down. Uh, our concept of, of operations is to use the payload for that. We need to do the, uh, the uplink receiver, and um, uh, so basically, as, as all good, good projects have, there is a large amount of scope creep, and um, we now do the demodulator, the decoder, uh, we also do the modulator, and we're providing the satellite ground station. Um, all in FPGA um, on the N310 and the R payload. So uh, a year ago, uh, here's a picture of Dan uh, presenting uh, a little prototype uh, physical layer QPS with QPSK. And, um, 
And on the, on the right, so the status today is that we've uh, tested, implemented, deployed this. It's compatible with the CCSCS standards, um, two megabits uplink, 50 megabits downlink. Uh, here's the bit error rate on the X310. Uh, you see the theoretical Shannon limit. You see what we got on the X310. And uh, you know, past 10 dB, uh, no, you don't get any errors for the amount of duration I was, I was running this. Um, could have run it longer. But um, yeah, and it translates directly over to our payload. So, Here's what that modem looks like. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not all that complicated. Uh, it's, uh, we'll start at the deepest part. There's no QPSK modulator, demodulator, uh, convolutional code, Viterbi, uh, read Solomon encode, read Solomon decode. And, uh, and then we, ju we just do present the read Solomon encoder with a bitstream, get a bitstream out, we do HDLC, and then we have a network ton so you can SSH to it and um, use all sorts of TCP IP network stack um, on the payload. And um, the physical layer is compatible with CCSDS. Now, how do we do it? Um, this is where the RFNOC uh, workflow comes in. Um, let's talk about the architecture first. Uh, just the way we chose to implement it. Uh, first thing we do is timer recovery. It's really straightforward. Um, this is a phase and frequency independent timer recovery. We use a timing error detector form a loop filter. Um, the timer recovery is nice to do out front. It, it helps, uh, if you have samples aligned, it makes the frequency recovery and phase recovery easier. Uh, so we do an FFT frequency recovery, find the peak, it's just kind of a, um, a nice way to, uh, to uh, pull in a wide frequency range, and then we do a phase lock loop to uh, clean up the rest of the results. Uh, pretty typical stuff, uh, typical loop, loop filter. And then what this gives us is a demodulator where we don't need to know anything about the data, no synchronization, uh, no, uh, yeah, no, no synchronization or correlation patterns needed, just um, present it with data and it'll uh, lock onto that. Uh, what was the actual implementation look like? Uh, we just started, put something together in Python. It was pretty quick to prototype what these things were, maybe um, single digit number of weeks. Um, we flipped over and uh, did an implementation in uh, C, C++. We can compare the inputs and outputs directly back to Python. Um, synthesize that with HLS. It creates uh, HDL that we can then wrap in Verilog wrappers. Uh, that, that takes a little bit longer, test at a component level, and then optimize and deploy. So here's, here's an example of our GNU radio flow graph, the obligatory GNU radio flow graph. So on the top left, you see our X300 where we have each of the components of the demodulator broken out. And um, this is a really great workflow. Um, we start, we have a radio. We could swap out the radio with a file source so we know, uh, control exactly what's on the input, look at exactly what's on the output, make sure that is um, identical to what we'd expect, run that through the Python algorithm, um, compare that to the HDL, um, make sure that what's implemented in the FPGA is actually what, what we tried to, try to, tried to accomplish here. Um, and then we just go down the stream with um, different uh, RF knock blocks and we can connect them up in various combinations to be able to debug what's exactly going on. Once that's working, then we squeeze everything, get in, everything together into a block that has different enable muxing paths to be able to enable disable different chains. Um, we've also got our, so you see our demodulator and our decoder uh, kind of back to back there. And on the right is a QPSK uh, received waveform that was um, over the air and, uh, and demodulated with the uh, receiver. Okay. Ah, so one, one other, another uh, fun trick we developed during the course of this, uh, if you have registers in your RF knock, uh, you can easily query those registers. And um, this is something that's in GRITIS now. Uh, you have a block that's a uh, register logger and uh, it can write to a CSV or write out to a console. And then um, you can have a probe that is corresponding to a particular RF knock block and just tell it which registers to read from and it'll, uh, it'll Read, read them for you um, in a loop. And so it kind of just makes debugging uh, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, you know, no driver writing or anything like that. Uh, another thing we did here um, was we wrote a hardware AGC. So uh, we give the AGC a pointer to the radio and uh, we do, since this is a continuous full duplex uplink downlink, we can lock onto the signal. Um, with the power saturated high, we do a binary search. If we see power, then lock onto it. Um, and then uh, just a little bit of uh, additional logic if, you know, if you're already at max gain. Um, but that, that state machine came together in a really quick, uh, quick amount of time. Um, uh, we just give it pointers to the different, uh, different blocks and go from there. Ah, and uh, here's the punchline. So, uh, on the top right is, uh, is an iperf command. We've got the uplink downlink um, 
uh, instrumented, fully, fully encoded. Uh, we're using a 50 megabits per second downlink with the overhead of HDLC and Reed Solomon. You get about 40 uh, to 42 uh, ish uh, megabits usable bandwidth. Um, so, this is an iperf3 output. We've got uh, no packets lost and 40 megabits over the air downlink. Uh, so, that's really cool. Um, and then the other thing that's really cool is on the left, this is a commercial um, software defined radio modem offering for. Uh, I won't mention, uh, but uh, you can see uh, hardware piece one on the top right is that, that little digitizer. You've got hardware piece two and three are kind of stacked, and hardware piece four, they do uplink, downlink um, in software and transport everything over Ethernet packets, and it gets about, um, well, a large latency. Um, what we've implemented is, has, uh, the latency is basically driven by your Reed Solomon code block. So uh, if you're running at our rates, you get 10 milliseconds uh, round trip ping latency. Uh, it runs on the E310, runs on the N310, which we're gonna be deploying to Svalbard in, uh, in a number of months, and it runs on our payload. So uh, this was just a massive success. Uh, it was me and another guy, and it took like uh, just a short number of months like working half time on it. So it's, uh, it was really fantastic. All right. The other thing that's, uh, that we do is, uh, is now we do full rate um, data captures uh, with E310. So uh, a couple, uh, you see on the mailing list, uh, if, you, if you pay attention, every now and then someone will pop up and say they have trouble recording greater than a few mega samples per second. <clears throat> Well, the 9361 digitizes 56 mega samples per second, and if you're using the analog devices, you can um, notionally get the full rate data back. So, um, with, the question is why? Uh, what, what's the limitation? So just a quick block diagram showing throughput. 9361 gets 56 mega samples. It gets into the FPGA fine. Um, but there's a bottleneck going from the FPGA to the arm. Uh, it, it maxes out if your arm is idle, 10 me uh, mega samples, otherwise like two. Um, and then on the other side, and when you're in the arm, you can write to software. If you have a null sync, you can pretty much keep up with whatever. If you're writing to file, or uh, like an SD card, you get uh, 20 megabyte, megabytes per second. If you write to a RAM disk, uh, that's, that's also basically unlimited. I mean, you can get many megabytes, hundreds. Uh, so anyway, the, uh, the number one limitation here is this, uh, is this pros, uh, PL to PS for programmable logic to process your bottleneck. Um, what can we do about that? Theoretically, the Zinc supports 600 megabytes per second. And um, yeah, so a couple ways to increase that. We can create a dedicated DMA, we can use bigger data packets, and we can use less processor activity. Uh, so that's, that's what we chose to do. Block diagram of that is on the bottom left. Um, and what we did here was uh, implement a new RF knock block that uh, also just uses an Axie 4 DMA directly from that block uh, to the processing system. And uh, the neat thing about that paradigm is that we can then still reuse the RF knock framework to move data around. Uh, and uh, we could use the RF knock data mover to get data back if we want to. We can use it for register reads, register writes. Uh, but now we have an alternate endpoint where we can override the general work function in GNU Radio and um, take samples straight from the fabric, uh, put it into a continuous memory allocation on the RAM. And then um, if we burst that, then we can burn it off uh, at our leisure. So um, that paradigm is, is um, is a way that at least allows us to get uh, 40 to 50 mega samples per second for some amount of time. It's limited basically by, um, well, number one, uh, what you're doing with the processor at that point, um, and number two, how much RAM do you have allocated um, before you run out of run out of space? Um, so it's it's a good good solution for us, and it and it allows us to collect the full uh, full mega uh, full 40 to 50 megahertz of the of the uh, 9361 um, without. With, with a few compromises. Um, at this point now, we're basically uh, limited by our file write rate, which, um, which I'm happy with. So, so, uh, so the, uh, the bottom line here, I think, is the E310 and the N310 can actually transfer data between the browser and the FPGA at full rates, but some assembly may be required. OK, so to summarize here, uh, what we found, um, in the last couple of years is that GNU Radio and RF NOC, um, they improve our development time, provide standardization, provides employees um, training, and um, people can come in having knowledge and go out uh, having knowledge and um, 
some modifications to use it in production, but overall, it looks pretty similar. We're gonna have flow graphs running, in, running um, on our satellite. Uh, now, we're pretty much ready for launch. We have a working comm system, we have full rate recordings, we have more applications um, that I just couldn't get into for time, uh, time reasons here. Um, and we're gonna begin operating in uh, low Earth orbit this year, 2018, and uh, we're excited. We have a literal product launch, so uh, watch, for, watch for updates soon. Thank you. And also, I'd be remiss if I don't say, we're also hiring, so come talk to us if you're interested. Okay, cool, so we do have time for questions, um, and then after that, we'll be closing out for the day. I just wanna do a quick comment before I open up. So there's two things I always try and debunk, and that is um, that you can only use GNU Radio for prototyping and not deployment in commercial environments, and the other one is, you don't need math after you graduate from university. And you just like debunk both of those in one talk, so I'm just gonna <laughs> point people to you guys. So can I just see hands again for the questions? Um, so you had one, and over there. So you first, and then, right. then you. No, 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 the other guy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, the other guy. On the, oh. on, the, on the satellite, did you? Did you? Uh, the other guy. Oh. <laughs> did, did you have to decide that there'll be certain FPGAs that we can reprogram while it's in orbit and certain FPGAs that we will not be allowed to reprogram or is everything gonna be reprogrammable while it's still in orbit? Ah, okay, so we have a satellite bus that's uh, eminently reliable. <laughs> it's, it's very, okay, so it's, it's, uh, we have a bus that's very reliable and we have a payload computer that could be more experimental. Does that answer your question? All right. <laughs> Did you contribute your auxiliary DMA code back to the GitHub? Um, you know, I, I consider that to be a, uh, you know, a utility, but um, I don't really, I, honestly, I don't know that anyone would be interested. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe this is wrong, but, uh, but it requires, I mean, you gotta, do, you gotta do a pretty heavy surgery, you gotta do a kernel driver, um, and then you've gotta like use you know, the application correctly to do it. So uh, I, I just see, I, I see it being a, a combination of like difficult to support and like, uh, and like, uh, I, I, it doesn't. It doesn't strike me as within the paradigm of what uh, what Edis is looking for. So I, 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 uh, I haven't. But you know, if there is interest, I'll. I'll cons I'm certainly open to consider it. Yeah, there are customers that would like that. <laughs> I'm sure there are. So uh, with our newer devices, we also have something called Liberio that gets you pretty close to that. Uh, from user land wrapped up in a nice library, it just gets slower if you then go through UHD to do all that. So there's a side path if you want to use that. The library is installed and has headers, so um, we're, we're looking to backport that to E310. Yeah. Okay, I think we can have two more questions. Um, was there one over there? I didn't see anything. You, did you have one? Oh, yeah, Ian. E EJ, I didn't really pick up on the use of the three different analog devices front ends. Your block there kind of showed one. Oh, you saw, um, you saw the top view of the payload. Mm -hmm. There's a module for the Zinc, there's a module for the 9361, and then on the other side, there's another module for another 90, there's two, two other modules for two more 9361s. So you're basically just looking at different frequency ranges concurrently with identical subsystems? Is that kind of? No, we have probably 10 to 15 antennas on the spacecraft. Okay. And they all are routed in a, a plethora of ways. Got it. There's another one over here. A question, when you, were, when you were talking about the kramer rao lower bounds you were, you were deriving to, to assess if your actual geolocations were, were within what you thought they should be, mm -hmm. did, did you use anything where you used an assumption of a, a priori probability? For example, you're in the Chesapeake, so there's some common transit lanes. So you might put a preferable probability to that, which would affect the kramer rao lower bound. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great idea. We didn't do that because we wanted to look more at the, um, at the the statistical um, uh, physics physics based measurements and not 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 quite wrap in that sort of extra layer of a priori knowledge um, but i mean that's that's certainly ideas that we're we'll be chasing down in the next uh, twelve to twenty four months you could probably like add tracking post processing to your raw measurements or something yes yes so. we do we will yeah okay final question is over there and then we'll wrap it up. Do you have like a low rate comms link and a way of bootstrapping the 
QPSK modem? I mean, what, what's the fallback, I guess? It's like chicken and the egg. Uh, we've got to sharpen our pencils a little bit, so uh, we do have a fallback, yes. <laughs>